everyone and welcome to Space Week Live episode 144, The Perfect Square of 12 and the beginning of Space Week season 5. That's right, Space Week started back in 2019 and so this is the fifth calendar year that we've been, uh, well, I've been doing this. So I want to wish everybody a happy new year. This is in fact January 1st of 2023. Um, any bets on how many times we'll mess up the year when we write it down, although although uh, people don't really use checks anymore, so we don't write the year too much. But um, as always, Space Week is a live Q&A session, so if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat, but do make sure to tag my name at Raw Space so we're sure to see the questions, and uh, they'll be collated and answered at the end. So... Uh, I took a bit of a break for family and holiday reasons, um, starting three weeks ago where we left off. The latter half of December was a fairly light on streamable launches, but it was nonetheless a rather tumultuous and eventful few weeks in space. So let's dig in. Now, in the last Space Week, on December 11th, I showed the SpaceX launch from earlier that same day of iSpace Hakuto-R Mission 1, a robotic lunar lander from Japan. I wanted to give an update on its status. Shortly after launch, iSpace established communications with the lander. The next day, they established a stable altitude, verified that the lander's core systems had no errors, and confirmed that the power supply was working. Uh, though I haven't found specific information about the lander's power source, I presume that it uses an RTG, or a radioisotope thermoelectric generator. This would allow it to generate power even during the moon's 13 and a half days of darkness. Two days later, uh, iSpace published the spacecraft's first images, such as this one of a crescent Earth backlit by the sun, taken 19 hours after launch. The out-of-focus component in the lower right is a plate containing the Hakuro, Hakuro R partner logos. This image was taken by iSpace's camera and transmitted directly to iSpace Mission Control. One of their corporate goals is to provide not just customer payload transport to the moon, but data transfer as well. This dramatic image is from the Canadensis Lunar Imaging System from Canada, one of the mission payloads, about two minutes after the spacecraft separated from the Falcon 9 upper stage. 
The upper stage is visible in the lower right. If we zoom in. The ring framing the shot are parts of the spacecraft that surround the camera, because of course it has a wide angle lens. Here you can see where the two cameras are located on the spacecraft. The Canadensis camera is kind of tucked under that gold covered arm on the left side. Three and a half <clears throat> days after launch, Hakuto R passed the lunar orbital path for the first time. However, it's far from reaching its goal. Four days after launch, the spacecraft completed its first orbital control maneuver, fine tuning its course toward the moon. And that's actually the last update we got from iSpace, but it is in the midst of its uh, month long coast phase out to its. Uh, its apogee. And uh, looking ahead, Hakuto R will reach its, its farthest point from Earth of 550,000 kilometers around January 20th. It will then spend two to three months swinging slowly back toward the Earth Moon system thanks to Earth's gravitational pull. Once it crosses the lunar orbital path again, it will fire its thruster to precisely line it up with the Moon. Four and a half months after launch, it will land and release its two rovers, one from Japan and the other from the UAE. Back here on Earth on December 11th, a Long March Force C launched the Xi'an 20 A and B satellites from Zhuquan in northwest China. The satellites will reportedly be used for on orbit verification tests of new technologies such as space environment monitoring. And as always, the white things falling off the rocket are foam insulation panels, they're not ice. On December 13th, uh, a robust Ariane 5 launched the Galaxy 35 and 36 television satellites and the MTG I-1 weather satellite into a geostationary transfer orbit. A tous de DDO, attention pour le décompte final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Allumage Vulcan. Allumage des EAP décollage. I always enjoy Ariane 5 uh, launches. It's a beautiful rocket. La propulsion est nominale. Only ever had a problem with the very first launch back in, what was it, 1996? Now, uh, deployment was successful, but they did not have uh, a live video feed from the rocket at the time. And we are off. How wonderful to see the mighty Ariane roaring across that equatorial sky. Definitely a launch to savor. We are now over one minute into the... All right. Now, <laughs> on December 14th, there was supposed to be a Russian spacewalk to move a radiator unit from the Rosviet module to the Nauka laboratory module. But as the cosmonauts were suited up and entering the airlock, 
a significant leak was observed coming from their docked Soyuz MS-22 spacecraft. Uh, since NASA was already broadcasting live in anticipation of the Russian spacewalk, we got to see the leak in all of its gl glory. Otherwise, it would have been a footnote in a NASA blog, and there may not have been any video uh, released to the public. Uh, now, Roscosmos had a live stream going as well, but they declined to show video of what was happening up in space. This video is a 4K AI upscaled version that I rendered from the NASA footage. The particles spraying all over the place were determined to be coolant from Soyuz's external coolant loop. The spacecraft also has an internal coolant loop, but it's my understanding that the two loops pull from the same reservoir, so they aren't isolated. The venting continued for more than four hours, likely completely draining Soyuz of all of its coolant. I looked for information on what type of coolant Soyuz uses, ammonia, which would quickly evaporate in space, or something nastier that might stick to ISS surfaces and potentially cause uh, additional problems. Unfortunately, Roscosmos isn't an open book like NASA, and I was unable to find the information. It was emphasized during the event that at no point was the crew of ISS in any danger, although in the days following the leak, the temperature inside the Soyuz reached a toasty 40 degrees Celsius or 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Subsequent inspection revealed a 0.8 millimeter hole in the external coolant line. The cause of this hole is presumed to be either a micrometeoroid or a tiny piece of space junk. It's unlikely that we'll ever know for sure. ISS gets pelted with micrometeoroids all the time, but to my knowledge, this is the first time in 24 years that an impact has caused a leak of this magnitude. Soyuz MS-22 launched on September 21st with ISS Expedition 67 crew members Sergei Prokopiev, Dmitry Patelin, and Frank Rubio. It was planned to return them to Earth this coming March, but now the fate of the vehicle is in question. Patching the hole doesn't seem likely, since the ISS might not be equipped with the tools and materials to do such a patch, and I seriously doubt that NASA would sign off on the crew readiness of a spacecraft that was patched in orbit, even if Roscosmos was okay with the risk. Flying the Soyuz with crew aboard and no coolant seems like a terrible idea, especially if the spacecraft was overheating while docked to the space station. Uh, they'd cook. It seems to me that the only safe way forward is to undock Soyuz MS-22 and deorbit it without any crew, then launch the Soyuz MS-23 vehicle to replace it, again with no crew. MS-23 could be launched as early as February. Another possibility would be to send up an unmanned crew dragon, but I don't know if one is available or ready. It's worth noting that A, this may be the first time in the history of the ISS that crew members might be stranded on the station with no viable escape vehicle to get them home, and B, there's no great rush in terms of time on orbit, though there might be once the additional risk of not having enough lifeboats is considered. A standard crew rotate Crew rotation is six months. A few spacefarers have spent more than a year in space at one time. The MS-22 crew have been there for less than four months. Roscosmos had planned to make a decision regarding how to proceed by December 27th, but they deferred that until sometime in January. So stay tuned. Also on the 14th was an SLS RS-25E engine test at the Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. Now, the RS-24E is the new, cheaper, expendable variant of the RS-25D engines that flew on the space shuttles. And on, uh, and on the Ar Artemis One SLS rocket. There are 12 more Ds in the inventory, enough for three more SLS launches. Beyond that, the new E engines will be used, like this one. 
The planned test duration was 500 seconds, eight and a half minutes, the burn time for an actual launch. But the test was terminated after just 209 seconds. If we fast forward a bit. I don't know if you heard that whoomph as they uh, as the engine was shut down. Uh, I'm not sure what made that sound. Whether that was an in, whether that was a result of of whatever prompted them to uh, terminate the test, or if it was maybe the sound of valves closing, which you know uh, ca caused the test to be terminated. I'm not sure, but in any case. Um, uh, test ran for less than half of the intended time. Rounding out a busy December 14th, a Long March 2D launched the Yaogan 3604 A and B satellites for the Chinese military. On December 16th, SpaceX launched from Vandenberg with NASA's Surface Water and Ocean Topog Topography Mission, or SWAT. Here we go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, engine ignition, and liftoff. Liftoff of SWAT, our first global survey of Earth's surface water to study how this ever-changing resource affects our climate. Now, SWAT will survey nearly all the water on the planet for the first time. It will track the rise and fall of water levels, study ocean features at ten times the resolution previously available, and measure more than a million lakes and rivers globally. NASA partnered with the French, Canadian, and UK space agencies on the mission. And now you're getting a good look at the onboard camera looking down towards the aft end of the rockets and you can see the, the Merlin engines coming to life there. And here's the booster landing back on the pad at Vandenberg. Stage one. It's about to land, how exciting. Coming in for its uh, landing burn there. Again, the grid fins moving ever so slightly to make sure that it's coming down exactly how they want it to come down. Yep, and you could see the pad coming into view. There it is. Landing. Wow, yeah. those sonic and booms. And then the sonic booms. Trademark sonic booms. Wow. And good touchdown of the stage one. Touchdown. Booster. Perfect. Stage oh. one landing is confirmed. So glad to see that. Now, that was NASA commentary. Uh, SpaceX actually did not. So I was unable to uh, stream this launch because it was right when I was taking my kids to school. Um, and the SpaceX channel no longer has the broadcast uh, visible. I'm not sure why. Also, some of the camera angles were not, and the interface is not SpaceX's like interface, and so I'm not sure what was up with that broadcast, but uh, uh, maybe SpaceX decided to take a step back and, and, and um, not be the primary broadcaster for that one because it was a NASA mission. Everything's looking nominal stage. Later that same day, from Cape Canaveral, SpaceX launched the O3B M Power 1 and 2 broadband internet satellites for SES of Luxembourg into a medium Earth orbit. 15 seconds. 2 minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Five, four, three, two, one. Engines full power. 
and lift off of SES and power. Go Falcon 9, go SES. Vehicle's pitching down range. M1D chamber pressure stop. Now, the first stage booster did land on the drone ship, but there wasn't a live video feed of it. Uh, both spacecraft separations were also nominal, but unfortunately we couldn't see either from the rocket cam because of the, uh, the angle at which they uh, were deployed. Also on the 16th, a Long March 11 launched from Xichang with the Xi'an-21 satellite, a sibling to the Xi'an-20 A and B that launched just a few days earlier. That is a pretty intense launch. Also very obviously solid rocket fuel based on that thrust profile. Cool to watch. Uh, <laughs> wouldn't want to be underneath it. On December 20th, Ariane Space launched a Vega C rocket. This is the new larger version of their Vega solid propelled vehicle with the Pleiades, Neo 5 and 6 Earth observation satellites. First, let's check out the launch. À tous de DDO, attention pour le décompte final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, top. Allumage B120, décollage. La propulsion est nominale, le pilotage est calme. Now, all was looking good until about three and a half minutes after the launch, during the Zafiro 40 upper stage burn, it became apparent that the rocket was deviating from its target trajectory. Ariane Space said that they observed an under-pressure on the Zafiro 20, I mean, the Zero, Zafiro 40. So if you look at the trajectory graphic at the bottom, you can see that that yellow line is dipping from the target green line. This was Vega's C's second launch. First launch in July of 2022 was successful. Its little sibling, the Vega rocket, has also traveled a rough road as well, experiencing two failures in three launches in 2019 and 2020. Italy-based Avio is the primary contractor for the Vega series. Ariane Space and the European Space Agency announced that they will establish an independent inquiry commission to investigate the failure which resulted in the loss of both satellites. Although, since the panel will be chaired by ESA's Inspector General and Ariane Space's Chief, Chief Technical Officer, I wonder if independent is really an accurate description, so long as they're honest, thorough, and pull no punches. Now, hopefully they get to the bottom of it and uh, uh, Avio fixes whatever is wrong. In front of us, we can see that the trajectory, it seems to be going, maybe, is it going off course? You, can you tell me? Oh, yes, it is going off course. Yes. Now, there was supposed to be a U.S. spacewalk on December 20th, but they had to cancel it due to a piece of space debris that was forecast to pass dangerously close to the ISS. The space station performed a maneuver to get out of the way, as per standard procedures. Especially after the Russian incident, NASA did not want to take any chances. Uh, they did manage to do the spacewalk two days later. Astronauts Josh Casada and Frank Rubio installed the fourth new 
IROSA, or ISS Rollout Solar Array, on the space station's port 4 truss. Uh, here you can see it rolling out in just a moment. Once all six IROSAs are installed, the space station's power generation capability will have increased by about a third. So there's the IROSA rolling out at two times normal speed. It's really cool. Once they release the bolts that, uh, that are holding the uh, IROSA back, it unrolls itself using only uh, uh, tension energy. It's not like that's not a powered rollout. It's a mechanical rollout. It's rolling itself out because of tension in the system. And uh, on the sides, uh, let's see if we can, here we go. In this shot, you can see on the sides, you see the white band on either side of the IROSA. Uh, up by the roll, it's flat, but down by the base, it's round. And that's because once the IROSA rolls out, that flat, uh, some sort of plastic or, or whatever material it is, that, fl that flat uh, band curls up uh, and then forms a, basically a rigid um, a support structure on the outside of the, the panel. It's really an ingenious design. I love the IROSAs. They're, they're a, uh, an excellent uh, uh, you know, piece of engineering, new technology. But, uh, yeah. All right. So that brings us up to last week. Uh, last Tuesday, a Long March 4B lifted off from Taiyuan with the Gaofen 1104 Earth Observation Satellite. Wednesday, SpaceX launched the 5-1 batch of Starlink satellites into a new polar orbit. The 5 designates the fifth shell of the Starlink constellation. 15 seconds. You might 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, now, I read some analytical speculation that these Starlink satellites may be a sort of half upgrade from the previous version, perhaps intended for military use. Star Shield, it's called. Uh, I hadn't been paying too close attention to the different Starlink variants, but uh, Star Shield is apparently a thing. And, uh, and there you go, military uh, Starlink satellites. Uh, they are certainly not the full version 2 Starlinks that SpaceX has been talking about, which are too big to be launched by anything but Starship at least in the form that they have been described. Anywho, I uh, try not to engage too much in speculation uh, because in the end, we don't know, we won't know what we know until we know it. Here's the booster landing. Stage one landing burn. And there you can see on your left hand screen, stage one has lit one engine to prepare for landing on our drone ship, a short fall of Gravitas. Landing leg deploy.
Stage one landing confirmed. And Falcon 9 has landed. Good landing, little off center, but that's all right. Unless you're being caught by uh, uh, chopsticks. <laughs> As in super heavy. On Thursday, a Long March 3B launched from Xichang with the Xi'an 10 O2 satellite, yet another in the Xi'an series to verify space technologies and monitor the space environment per official sources. On Friday, a SpaceX Falcon 9 lifted off for the last time in 2022 from Vandenberg with the Israeli Eros C3 Earth Imaging Satellite. T minus 15 seconds. 10, 9, Ocho, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. one. Looking kind of grainy. Oops. And here is the booster landing. Stage one landing burn. And there we've had the first stage. Stage two FTS is saved. First stage landing burn has begun. Let's watch as Falcon 9 touches down for landing. And here is the satellite deployment sped up a bit. With what appears to be a sliver of light on the Earth's limb in the background. As always, thanks for tuning in and have a great new year. We'll see you all in 2023. Oh, hello. <laughs> all right. So. Um, looking up, <laughs> taking a look further back into space history, uh, on January 2nd, tomorrow, will mark the, oh gosh, I don't even want to do the math, um, the exith uh, anniversary of the launch of Luna 1, which was Russia's first uh, lunar mission intended to impact the moon. Unfortunately, it, and this was in 1959. Uh, unfortunately, it missed the moon by about 5,995 kilometers, becoming the first artificial satellite to orbit the sun. So, uh, through adversity, uh, we gain a footnote in, uh, in the history books. And then Wednesday will mark the, let's see, uh, 10, 16, 17, 18, 19th anniversary, 19th anniversary of the Mer A Spirit uh, rover landing on Mars. So, uh, Spirit and Opportunity, the venerable old rovers, which are now both uh, no longer uh, functional, uh, were launched back in uh, 2004. And uh, they were designed for a 90 Sol mission, a Sol being 24 hours and change, about 24 and a half hours. Uh, that's a Martian day. Uh, but Spirit operated for almost six years, 
Its last transmission was on March 22, 2010. Opportunity lasted for much longer, but it, it too went silent a couple of years ago uh, as it was uh, getting dark and its batteries were low. Now, looking ahead to this week, there is only one launch on the schedule. Tuesday, January 3rd at 9.56 a.m. Eastern, 14.56 UTC, SpaceX will launch the sixth transporter rideshare mission. The Falcon 9 will lift off from Cape Canaveral. On board will be more than 100 small satellites bound for a sun-synchronous orbit. This particular broadcast will be a special one. One of the payloads on board Transporter 6 is EOSat-1, an agricultural Earth observation satellite. I have partnered with EOS Data Analytics, the owner of that satellite, to do a deep dive on uh, their satellite before and during the launch stream. So during the code, uh, I'll be introducing the satellite before the SpaceX segment begins, and then during the coast phase, I'll show my interview with a technician and an agricultural scientist from EOS DA. Uh, it'll be fun and informative. So that was a pleasure to work with them, and uh, so this will be a, a different kind of raw space launch stream. I want to take a moment to thank our Hearty Channel supporters. Uh, if you're interested in supporting the channel, feel free to uh, take advantage of any of the available options. There's Patreon, PayPal, there's a merch store if you want uh, some cool swag to either wear or drink from. <laughs> um, and again, thank you all for your support. All right, let me get to your questions. Let me see if the script did its thing. Looks like it did. Uh, all right. Maria C. Kutujan. Happy 2023. Same to you. Uh, Merry, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Uh, happy Hanukkah. Happy Kwanzaa. And Happy New Year. Uh, and whatever other Boxing Day. I don't know. Whatever other holidays you, you observe at the at the end of the year uh, and the beginning of the next. Um, happy ones to you and yours. Also, Maria Kutujan, uh, let's see. What kind of fuel is used in the capsules that take astronauts to the International Station? Is it the same fuel for all the different capsules? So there are currently only two, cr currently only two crew rated vehicles uh, in existence. There's the Russian Soyuz and the SpaceX Crew Dragon. Um, well, so there's also the Boeing Starliner, but that has not yet flown with a human crew. So um, uh, the, let's see, I am not that familiar with the Soyuz's technical specifications. Uh, I'm not sure what fuel it uses. It probably uses hypergolic fuel because it's stable until you combine it. And um, uh, yeah, and, and and that's also what what uh, the crew crew dragon uses. It uses hypergolic uh, UDMH or unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine uh, and uh, nitrogen tetroxide, also called dinitrogen tetroxide or NTO. Uh, those are typically the, the fuels used for for crew spacecraft. Um, the uh, the danger, though, is that particularly well, it's they're nasty chemicals, and you don't want to uh, ingest them. Which is why, for example, when a crew dragon uh, capsule lands, splashes down in the water, uh, SpaceX spends uh, quite a bit of time, up to an hour or an hour and a half making sure that the air around the capsule is, uh, uh, is not hazardous because, um, again, you know, the capsule undergoes a lot of forces when it splashes down in the ocean. And, you know, if there's any kind of, um, fuel leak, which you'll, you'll see by the orange smoke that's typical of the nitrogen tetroxide, um, 
you know, then they don't want the astronauts breathing that. But uh, it's still a very useful fuel for, especially for space applications. And I assume that's what the Soyuz uses. Now for attitude, attitude control, uh, typically you're gonna have cold um, nitrogen thrusters, uh, you know, not, not uh, uh, a nasty fuel like, like hydrazine or solid propellant or anything like that, or even, you know, uh, oxygen and, and whatever, oxygen and, and uh, RP1 or oxygen and hydrogen or oxygen and methane. <laughs> uh, because those are cryogenic and uh, those are not going to be stable long term because if they're not maintained at cryogenic temperatures, which, which takes a lot of energy, then they're going to be constantly trying to uh, evaporate, the fuel is, um, and that increases the pressure in fuel tanks, which if you have a beefy steel tank on Earth is no big deal. But if you're in a lightweight spacecraft with aluminum tanks or even, you know, lightweight thin steel tanks, um, that's not going to do. You have to constantly vent that pressure or you're going to blow up your fuel tank and your spacecraft. Um, all right. So MD5632, um, maybe it's time we should all learn Chinese. Uh, well... It's never not useful to know a language. Uh, I'm not sure that I have the mental bandwidth to take on Chinese, but um, but uh, it does come in handy knowing uh, a bit of Spanish, I will say. Uh, maybe not for rocket launches, but for everyday, uh, you know, understanding what people are saying here in the United States, because there's a, there are a lot of uh, Spanish speakers around. But uh, yeah, it would be useful to know Chinese, Japanese, French, Russian, and I could really know what uh, what the cosmonauts are saying on their on their spacewalks. Uh, MD fifty six thirty two. I wonder if this is going to be the future. Increasingly more scrubbed spacewalks uh, because of debris getting close. I would say that's possible, but not terribly likely. the The Russian spacewalk was scrubbed because. Um, it just happened to occur at the same time that the leak was noticed in the Soyuz. And that's just a matter of bad timing. Um, similarly, the U.S. spacewalk was scrubbed because of an incoming piece of debris, which uh, they had to quote-unquote dodge. Uh, but again, that's just a matter of timing. So... I guess you could argue that if there is an increased frequency of debris threats to the ISS, then that thereby increases the likelihood that there will be scrubbed spacewalks. But the two incidents were were pretty much just bad luck as far as timing. Um, and so, yeah. And again, like even despite the debris, d despite what happened to the Russians and despite the um, the quote-unquote near miss with the debris that delayed the U.S. spacewalk. They still went out there and did their spacewalk two days later and had no problem at all. So, um, and in fact, the debris wasn't, you know, they have a, they have a, like a, a, a buffer zone around the ISS and the debris was not, um, like you can't predict like to the very, you know, meter where things are going to where things are going to fly um but they predicted that it would be within what is it like a kilometer and a half of the station or something like that which is a pretty wide margin uh for a a small piece of debris but it increases the the risk of a potential strike and therefore they have to take measures to ensure that doesn't happen because uh you know they can't track micrometeoroids. They're too small, like the one that hit the Soyuz. Uh, but they can track larger debris. You know, let's say, I don't know, maybe an inch or larger. And uh, if something an inch wide were to hit the space station, that would punch a big hole. Um, and so they definitely want to avoid avoid that. Now, the small stuff, the, the space station gets hit with that all the time. And most of the time, it's no big deal. It leaves little marks on the 
surfaces of the station, but um, uh, it's designed to withstand that. Uh, but apparently the uh, the Golden BB hit the uh, the Russian Soyuz mod, uh, spacecraft and uh, uh, punched that little hole. I mean, the hole itself was 0.8 millimeters. So, and, and that tiny little hole resulted in the loss of all of the coolant of, of Soyuz. Um, Julian, raw space, what is ferrofluid, mag magnetic fuel? No, ferrofluid, so I presume that you saw uh, Action Lab's new video on ferrofluids being the future of space flight or whatever. Uh, I saw that uh, video title and I, it piqued my interest, but I didn't actually watch it. Uh, <laughs> uh, ferrofluid is uh, a magnetic, magnetically responsive goo uh, that can be manipulated using uh, magnetism. And uh, I don't, I'm not a physicist or a chemist, and so I couldn't tell you a ton about it, but it's really cool to watch people play with it. And uh, as far as it being used as a fuel, again, I haven't seen that uh, Action Lab video. Uh, and so, I mean, if the, because ferro, ferro means iron, and uh, like that prefix means iron. And so it's basically iron with something else that makes it a fluid or a goo or a suspension. And, um, and so it's really the, the magnetized iron, which is responding to the magnetic fields. And so, uh, iron is not a fuel. And so, you know, it would have to be the suspension itself, like the, the goo that the iron is in that, uh, would be combustible in order for there to be a ferrofluid uh, fuel would be my guess. Again, not having seen that video, but uh, I'm also not a rocket science, uh, rocket engineer. So uh, take my opinions or, or, or insights with a grain of salt, but that's my take on the matter in any case. Um, armchair quarterbacking here. John Sloan, uh, question, Crew Dragon can, can add seats instead of cargo. Could crew come back by sending seats up to fit in Crew Dragon? Uh, additional question, what happens in an emergency with no Soyuz? So, um, so two-part question. Um, if you're not familiar, if you're not familiar, Crew Dragon was designed to accommodate up to seven crew. Now, in the configuration that was certified uh, by NASA for use, uh, ferrying astronauts to the space station, there are only four seats. The vehicle is designed to accommodate seven. However, to my knowledge, it has not been certified uh, to be used with seven, not be certified, not been certified by NASA. So, uh, uh, you know, I... Uh, I don't know if the if the four seats is more due to NASA's uh, crew rotation cadence or due to other considerations, weight considerations, or maybe they wanted additional cargo to you know to to uh, uh, fill out the mass capacity of of the vehicle. Um, but physically, it should be possible to add up to three more seats in a Crew Dragon, but I don't know if NASA would allow that. And uh, uh, it's also possible that SpaceX, that the current vehicles are, are, are not actually built with that capability. You know, I know that the intention was to fly with up to seven passengers, but it's possible that the current vehicles are not actually built uh, with, you know, attachment points and, and whatnot for seven seats. And so, it, you know, I'm not sure. That would be proprietary information at SpaceX and, and privy to SpaceX and NASA. Uh, good question, though. Now, as for the second part, what happens in an emergency with no Soyuz? 
Well, um, it's critically important that uh, the ISS essentially have a life raft capability for all crew members at all times when possible. <laughs> Obviously, right now, that may not be possible because of the coolant leak on the Soyuz uh, and Roscosmos having not yet determined or not published anyway their determination regarding whether they deem the Soyuz to be uh, safe or not. Uh, also, even if Roscosmos says it's safe, NASA might not agree. And one of the crew members of, uh, that rode up on that Soyuz, MS-22, was an American astronaut. Uh, there were two cosmonauts and one astronaut. So if NASA doesn't agree, but Roscosmos thinks it's safe, then, you know, what do they do? Do they send, do they, do they bring the cosmonauts home and leave the astronauts stranded um, without, a, without any kind of vehicle? Uh, and if they did that, would the cosmonauts even be safe aboard Soyuz or would they overheat? Would they burn up? Um, also, what, be, what would be the political fallout for Russia basically abandoning one of its passengers, uh, you know, without a, without a way to get home? Uh, I think it's far more likely that they would simply send up the MS-23 vehicle. Uh, and uh, though they will probably do that in February, which is the earliest they can have it ready, per what Roscosmos has stated previously. Um, you know, so they would, they would basically ditch MS-22. They would just deorbit it over the Pacific or whatever. And then MS-23, they would send up with nobody on it. And it would dock autonomously, what, just like a cargo craft, uh, like the Progress. And, uh, and then they would have basically their, you know, dealer loaner car <laughs> to get back to Earth. Um, now, if there was an emergency on ISS, uh, then some people on the ground would have to make some very hard decisions. So let's say that ISS was struck by a piece of space debris and uh, they determined that they had to abandon the station, which of course has never happened. And it, the likelihood that it will happen is low because large debris is tracked and the ISS is capable of maneuvering to avoid such things. But if it did happen, um, uh, then, yeah, there would be some very difficult decisions to make. You know, they would have to, and this is, this is what happens during emergencies. Risk, is, risk assessments and risk evaluations uh, shift based on the urgency of the circumstance. And this was kind of what we, you know, that's what triage is all about. You know, in a, in a suburban hospital, um, your broken leg might receive top priority. But on the battlefield, your broken leg might be low on the totem pole, and there might be much more critical injuries for the battlefield doctors to concern themselves with. And so, um, you know, similarly, outside of of a uh, uh, of an emergency situation, it may be acceptable to wait for a new vehicle to be sent up. But if it's a matter of life or death or it, it's a very serious circumstance, and they really need to get the crew off of the space station, then um, uh, you know, they, they, they might have to accept the risk of riding on an unsafe uh, uh, Soyuz uh, vehicle, or maybe even in crew dragon if if the soyuz like i don't know if if there's a way to uh, like i don't know how rough uh re-entry is if it would be at all possible to um like cram some people on three additional people on a crew dragon you know and strap them down or or pad them with you know with with uh bags or something i have no idea uh, we've never had to do anything like that. Um, you know, I mean, we've had vehicles that burned up on re-entry. Um, you know, we've had 
emergency circumstances, but we've never had to abandon the space station and we've never had to uh, accommodate crew on vehicles that we knew were uh, either not configured for that many people or that were unsafe, such as the potentially the Soyuz. So uh, hopefully there are no emergencies. There hasn't been a critical emergency on the ISS in any of its 24 years of existence. Um, uh, but that's definitely something that I assure you, the folks at Roscosmos and NASA uh, and SpaceX have been uh, uh, intently discuss discussing because it's important to have these questions answered before they, you know, before the emergency happens. I mean, they have procedures in place uh, and they, they have to nail all that down well ahead of time uh, so that if something does happen, they can make a decision without, without additional delay. Uh, great questions. Thank you. MD5632, the spacecraft they used to arrive at the ISS is also their return vehicle. Not sure if a spare capsule was ever considered. Uh, so if, if what you mean by that is, uh, was a, was the possibility of sending up an extra uncrewed crew vehicle, something that was ever considered by either NASA or Roscosmos, not to my knowledge, I'm sure it was discussed, but uh, there's never been a spare vehicle up there uh, that I'm aware of that, uh, uh, you know, in other words, if a crew vehicle is launched, then it, it always has a crew in it. Now, it might be a crew of two. You know, there have been Soyuz launches, which only had two crew instead of uh, three, but... Uh, there's always been a crew. There's never, to my knowledge, been a, a Soyuz launch to the to the space station with with no uh, crew. Now, as far as SpaceX, there was of course the Demo One mission of Crew Dragon, which sent up the vehicle with no crew on board, and it docked just fine um, because its docking system is is autonomous and uh, can be controlled from the ground anyway, if need be. But uh, uh, as far as like having an extra one sitting around, seems like it would be a good idea. But um, yeah, they don't currently, <laughs> nor have they ever. All right, looks like I'm caught up on the questions. Let me see if there are any more in the chat. Uh, all right. So it looks like there's some lively discussion about ferrofluids, um, the Andromeda TV series. Okay. <laughs> looks like that'll wrap it up for this week. This was a big one. I uh, had three weeks to catch up on and a, a lot of uh, interesting and eventful things happened. So uh, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, you know, come back for the live streams and hope to see you next week. Uh, same, well, an hour earlier because I started late today, but uh, same time, same channel. Until then, keep it raw and may the Bennu be with you. And Happy New Year again.